Good morning. I'm Kim McCleary, President and CEO of the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall. Thank you all for joining us today. We hope all is safe with you and yours. I'm very pleased to announce a new weekly series that starts today called Politics in the Time of Coronavirus with politics professor Dan Schnur. The series takes an analytical approach to the biggest headlines of the week and elevates the stories you may have missed. Dan, thank you so much for being here today. I'll turn it over to you. Well, Kim, thank you very much. And thanks to everyone at LA World Affairs Council Town Hall and to all of you who tuned in for the first in this webcast series in which we talk about the week's politics every Thursday at 11 p.m., excuse me, 11 a.m. Uh, Pacific time. Um, as Kim mentioned, my name is Dan Schnur, and I've had the privilege of joining many of you for programs in the past. But for those of you who haven't joined us before, what I'll tell you just at the outset is I will approach these conversations each week the same way I do my classes. And what I mean in that context, what I mean in that sense, is it's not my job to tell a well-informed, well-educated, well-read group of individuals like all of you what to think or who to vote for or which side to take. So I come out, I'll come at this each week, not as an advocate for red or for, for blue, for Democrat or Republican, for left or for right, but rather to do the best I can to offer some analysis on the political news of the day. And then as Kim mentioned, to leave as much time as possible for your questions as we go through the hour. So what I'll do most weeks is I'll offer you a few topics at the beginning that I'm gonna to try to cover in my opening comments. And then, uh, as Kim mentioned, then we'll go to your questions on any of these three topics or anything else that you'd like to talk about in the world of politics. So today, the three issues that I really want, I found most interesting that I wanted to address is one, uh, the burgeoning, the growing discussion about reentry. In other words, when are our lives going to be able to get back, if not all the way back to normal, to some semblance of it? When is society going to open up again? And of course, the profound questions will be answered in the context of the medical discussion and the economic discussion. But of course, it's become a critical political question as well. And we'll come back to that in just a minute. So when we're going to talk about reentry. The second, uh, now that Joe Biden is the Democratic nominee for president after Senator Sanders' withdrawal last week, we're going to talk about the challenge Biden faces, particularly in terms of democratic unity and enthusiasm for his ticket. And then third and finally, uh, we'll talk about the challenges that exist in a time of pandemic for voting in November. We saw all sorts of controversy in the Wisconsin primary last week. The question going forward is how the rest of us are going to adjust to this new reality when it comes time for us to vote in a general election this fall. So let's, uh, let's start by talking about uh, re the reemergence um, of our society, the reopening of our country. And the way I'll frame this question is I'll offer you just a historical point. In the last century, in the last 100 years, there are only four presidents of the United States who lost their reelection campaign. They were, in reverse order, George H.W. Bush, Gerald Ford, excuse me, G George H.W. Bush, Jimmy Carter, Gerald Ford, and Herbert Hoover. And the rhetorical question I'll ask you is what did all those four men have in common? And the answer is all four of them were in presidents during an economic recession. By contrast, the presidents over the last hundred years who served during a time of growing economy, uh, Barack Obama, George W. Bush, Bill Clinton, Ronald Reagan, Lyndon Johnson, Dwight Eisenhower, even Calvin Coolidge, every single one of them was reelected during a growing economy. Now, I know what some of you are thinking is, what about Franklin Roosevelt? He was president during the Great Depression, of course. But interestingly enough, if you were to look back at unemployment statistics for his reelection campaigns in 1936 and 1940 and in 1944, in each, each of those three years, even in 36, uh, when the, the Great Depression was very, very pronounced, unemployment was dropping. 
So even for Franklin Roosevelt, the economy, while certainly not strong in his first couple terms in office, was heading in the right direction. So now if you're Donald Trump and you know that information, either because you've studied it or you just sense it, it's a pretty simple equation. Donald Trump knows that presidents who serve during economic downturns don't get reelected. Presidents who serve during economic growth periods do. And for three years now, Donald Trump has been talking about the strength of the US economy. And of course, one of the most pronounced effects, one of the most pronounced effects of the coronavirus pandemic is of course it's devastated our economy. Uh, uh, the official unemployment rate is lagging behind some estimates, but smart people who examine labor markets say that we're already over 20% unemployment. And Donald Trump knows and his advisors know that if the economic conditions in this country do not improve between now and November, his reelection becomes much, much more difficult. Um, so he's been talking uh, for some weeks now about the importance of opening back up. And he's, been fa he's faced resistance from his own medical advisors, uh, from governors of both parties around the country. And as of yesterday, from any number of Wall Street and business experts who he's tapped to serve as an advisory committee for him on this question of reopening. Um, so there's a lot of resistance to this. And Trump, like I said, he knows that without an economic comeback, he can't get reelected. But, big but, on the flip side, Trump also knows that if he pushes to open up the country too soon, and we see a second white wave of outbreak, then that would doom his reelection campaign. The president himself has said this is, his, this is his biggest decision ever in his life. And that's true, both in terms of the real world consequences of our health and of our economic sustenance, but it's also by far the biggest political question he has faced in this term. Open up too early and he'll face a pronounced voter backlash. Wait too long and there's potential political consequences as well. So right now, despite uh, some of his more assertive comments, we'll call them, earlier this week, when Donald Trump said that he was in charge of this decision, it appears right now that he's thought better of that. And while he's gonna continue to talk and continue to be very visible, it does appear now that he's gonna continue to let the, let the governors of the country take the lead on these questions. And just like he allows them and has, has allowed them to make decisions on a case-by-case -case basis in terms of closing down their economies and their communities. My guess is, is despite the, the talk, ultimately he's gonna let them make these decisions for themselves, if only so, if it turns out to be the wrong decision, there's a shared responsibility. And for any of you who'd like to talk more about this question, about the reopening, as it relates to Trump or to Congress or to the governors, by all means, send your question in and Jessica and I will do our best to get to as many as possible. A couple of other quick points though, before we open up this conversation and, uh, and get to your questions. Second thing I wanted to talk about is what I would call a democratic enthusiasm gap. Joe Biden is now the democratic nominee. Uh, Bernie Sanders endorsed him earlier and significantly more enthusiastically than his endorsement of Hillary Clinton four years ago. It appears that the two of them, uh, Vice President Biden and Senator Sanders, have a stronger personal rapport than Sanders ever had with Clinton. But for any number of reasons, uh, Sanders did endorse this week and did appear to do so with a, a, a decent amount of enthusiasm. Now that's important for, uh, for Joe Biden. And I think most of you know why, but let me try to quantify for you how important that is. Um, most public opinion polls, most national public opinion polls, show, guide, show Biden currently enjoying a somewhat comfortable lead uh, in polls, usually a lead of five, six, seven points over Donald Trump. Uh, the CNN poll uh, was a bit of an outlier. It showed him with an 11-point lead. But dig deeper into that CNN poll that came out last week. And what that poll showed is in addition to asking voters who they preferred in a general election, they asked voters how excited they were about the election. And what those results showed, and it's been reflected in plenty of other public opinion research as well, 
is that right now, at least at this early stage in mid-April, Republican voters are much more enthusiastic than Democratic voters. And it's by a fairly sizable margin, 64% of Republicans say that they're enthusiastic and excited about this, the election this November. Only 48% of Democrats do. And one of Biden's biggest challenges will be to close that enthusiasm gap. That's why not only Bernie Sanders' endorsement, but Barack Obama's endorsement and Elizabeth Warren's endorsements are so important. Because the same voters um, who were slow to support and may not have supported Secretary Clinton in her campaign four years ago are the Democrats who are still less enthusiastic about Biden's candidacy. Just before Sanders' endorsement, I saw polling that showed that 15%, 15% of Sanders voters say that they'll vote for Donald Trump. And there's a slightly, and there's an additional percentage, five, six, seven percent, that say they won't vote at all. So if you look at it one way, that means Joe Biden has the support of 80% of Bernie Sanders voters. But that's not good enough in a close election. And convincing that five or six percent will say they won't vote to vote for him and bringing back some of those Sanders voters who are now saying they'll vote for Trump is critically important for Biden. Uh, just by way of comparison, in 2016, between 10 and 12% of Sanders voters ended up voting for Trump in November, according to exit polls. So Biden has to find a way to get that 15% number down pretty considerably in the months ahead. Now, one way of dealing with that and I know a lot of you've been reading about this and thinking about it, is through Vice President Biden's selection of his own running mate. Now, as you all know, the Vice President committed last month, he pledged that he would pick a woman to be his running mate. And while there isn't time today, at least not in this section of the discussion, to go through all the potential running mates available to him, I would say that Biden has a fundamental choice to make when he picks that running mate. Does he pick a running mate who can excite the Democratic base to a greater degree than they are now? The most progressive Democrats, younger voters voted for minority, minority communities? If so, well, then someone like Elizabeth Warren might make sense. Senator Kamala Harris from here in California. Another Senator who hasn't gotten as much attention but might be worth learning about is Tammy Baldwin, the Senator from my home state of Wisconsin. On the other hand, if Biden and his advisors decide he needs a running mate to help him reach out to the political center, then perhaps Amy Klobuchar, the senator from Minnesota, makes sense. Gretchen Whitmer, the governor from Michigan, has gotten a lot of attention in recent weeks, primarily because of her back and forth with President Trump. And another relatively centrist uh, Democrat to keep an eye on would be Catherine Cortez Mastro, the senator from the state of Nevada. One tip I'd offer on this, is despite the fact that no shortage of Democrat progressives are very, very big fans of Elizabeth Warren, I'll tell you here today with some confidence, I don't see any way whatsoever that Biden can pick Warren to be his running mate. And that's not about ideological differences, that's simply because Elizabeth Warren, the senator from Massachusetts, represents a state with a Republican governor. And if a US senator leaves office for any reason, before her or his term is completed, the governor of that state selects the replacement. And given the very, very intense fight going on for control of the Senate this November, Democrats simply can't afford to have Elizabeth Warren replaced with a Republican senator picked by Charlie Baker, the Republican senator of that state. I also said that we would talk about November voting and how that's going to take place. But I've been going for about 15 minutes now and really do want to get to your questions. So Jessica, depending on how many questions we have so far, why don't we open it up? And hopefully that's a topic that we'll be able to cover along with the others over the course of the next 40 minutes or so. Thank you, Dan. Yeah, we're getting some questions about the November election. So I, I'm guessing we will jump into that. Um, one of the questions was submitted early. Um, voter suppression has been and remains a serious issue in the United States. 
Now the administration is threatening not to provide the necessary funding to, to prop up the U U.S. Postal Service, a government agency essential to expanding vote by mail for the general election in November. Since each state creates and controls its own voting system, what safeguards exist, what remedies exist to address and prevent voter suppression, and uh, sorry, especially when Trump is quoted as saying that he thinks mail-in voting is a terrible thing and is asking Republicans to oppose it, claiming that vote by mail hurts GOP candidates and is susceptible to fraud. Okay, so as Jessica mentioned, we did get some early questions. And while this program um, and all of our programs right now are open to LA World Affairs Council town hall members and non-members alike, one of the perks that we do try to provide for our members is to give them a chance to send in questions even before our program starts to make sure that they have a chance to get asked. What we found in the past, unfortunately, is we get a lot more questions than we have time to answer. So uh, for those of you who are members or thinking about becoming members of LA World Affairs Council Town Hall, and you can find that information uh, on the organization's website, this is uh, one of the benefits you get, is you make sure that your question uh, gets raised and I'll do my best to answer it. So fascinating question um, about voting this fall. And what I would tell you is something that's somewhat counterintuitive in this current debate. Historically, over the years of mail voting in most states in the country, voting by mail, either the traditional absentee balloting that's taken place in years past, or the no excuses mail voting that California and many other states have now, historically, mail voting has generally helped Republicans a lot more than it's helped Democrats. And in fact, the same day that President Trump was warning Republicans about the dangers of mail voting, the Republican National Committee had sent out a mailer to their members that they had already prepared in advance, talking about the importance of encouraging Republicans to vote by mail this November. Um, why is that? Why have Republicans been helped by this more in the past? Well because Republicans tend to be not only, Republican voters tend not only to be more conservative, of course, but somewhat older. And older and more conservative voters we've found are much more likely to apply to vote by mail and to work their way through that process. The president doesn't agree with that, but a couple things that I would say to reassure the concerns of the questioner. Number one, even though the Wisconsin Supreme Court and the US Supreme Court weighed in on behalf of Republican challenges in the state of Wisconsin last week. It's notable that the most important race on that ballot was not the primary between Sanders and Biden, because at that point Biden was pretty much on a glide path, as we talked about earlier, but rather there's a critically important campaign in Wisconsin last week uh, for the state Supreme Court and a conservative uh, incumbent. They don't run on party labels. Uh, for judge, of course. Uh, the conservative incumbent judge lost by a very large margin to the more progressive challenger. And in Wisconsin, it is very, very rare for a judicial incumbent to lose under any circumstances. So I think reassurance point number one, uh, given the questioner's concern, is those efforts to restrain and restrict voting in Wisconsin ended up not helping the conservative candidate if only it appears because Democratic voters were so much more motivated to turn out. The second, and I think even more impactful point I'd make here is that even while the president is talking about his concerns about mail voting, any number of Republican governors around the country, in Ohio, in New Hampshire, in Maryland, in several other states are already talking about how in their states, they want more voting, more mail voting. They want more early voting. So this debate doesn't look like it's going to break down on a traditional Democratic-Republican axis, but rather is a debate within the Republican Party about the advisability of mail voting. And if there is not a clear consensus in the party on that, I suspect that the question is concerns um, may not and hopefully will not be realized. Thank you. Uh, this is another early question. What's going to happen to traditional campaigns, town hall meetings, and large rallies? Wow. So what happens to campaigning as we've known it for all of recorded history? Well, at least for the time being, if not longer, those types of campaigns are, are over. 
And I'd recommend a really smart piece written on the political website last week by Jeff Greenfield. Many of you may remember Jeff Greenfield, the very astute political commentator over the years on PBS, CBS, and other television networks. He wrote a really smart uh, article analysis about how campaigns are going to change. And what he pointed out, and I suspect the questioner was thinking about also, is the types of campaigning we're used to. Big rallies where people stand shoulder to shoulder, in-person campaigning with fundraisers or volunteers, handshaking, hugging, kissing babies. None of that's going to happen anymore, at least not until we have uh, uh, a cure uh, for COVID-19. And that's a challenge for candidates of all parties across the political spectrum. Donald Trump loves those huge rallies. Joe Biden's greatest talent as a campaigner is hand-to-hand, -hand, person to person. They're both deprived of those uh, go-to campaign skills. And what's going to happen over the next several months is both of them, as well as dozens, if not hundreds, of candidates for Congress, for governor, for senator, for state and local office all around the country, are going to have to figure out a way to relearn those skills and apply them to the type of campaigning that we see on social media that we're seeing in this kind of conversation that's taking place by phone. And it's obviously not an adequate replacement for in-person campaigning. But the one piece of solace I'd offer for anyone who's particularly worried about their favorite candidate or their favorite, their favorite party is we're all in this together. And it doesn't appear that one party or the other necessarily enjoys uh, an advantage in this world. What I will say briefly before we go on to the next question, Jessica, um, is in 2016, most neutral analysts believe that the Trump organization did a far superior job of organizing online, and doing its campaigning digitally than Clinton's campaign did. The Democrats have been scrambling over the last few years to make up for that. Well, let's just say their incentive to continue making up that gap has is, is grown very, has grown tremendously in recent weeks. Thank you. Uh, one more early question. Um, what will be the future of diplomacy? What will the United Nations role be? And what's going to happen with the world conferences when leaders are supposed to come together and that's not something they can do right now? Wow, well, that's a question that I'll do my best to answer briefly. But Jessica, Kim, we might wanna think about a separate uh, LA World Affairs Council town hall program just on that question. Uh, the pandemic on a global stage, not just from a health standpoint, but from geopolitical and uh, in diplomatic, uh, diplomatic considerations as well. I'd offer a couple quick thoughts though, um, along with the plea for a larger long and longer uh, sole program on this. Um, even before the pandemic, uh, the US was retreating from the rest of the world and many other countries, many of the other Western democracies were retreating as well. We've already seen over the last few years signs of growing isolationism. Um, and this is not unique to Donald Trump. You can argue, as is the case on many matters, that President Trump is a symptom rather than a cause of this isolationism. It's worth noting that both he and Secretary Clinton in the 2016 campaign opposed the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the sweeping trade deal that President Obama had negotiated and had been supported uh, by President Bush as well. And we're seeing this, of course, not just in the US, but in Great Britain with Brexit, throughout Europe, and increasingly in Latin American and Asian Pacific countries as well. And so my greatest concern is that this virus will not change that trajectory, but rather intensify it and make us even more suspicious of other countries. The president's decision to with withdraw funding from the World Health Organization earlier this week is a profound example of that. I think one of the scenes which th things we've seen already is that historically, when the world has faced a global crisis, they've looked to the US for leadership. That hasn't been the case in this, uh, during this current crisis. And the question is going forward, whether in 2021 or 2025, if the next American president moves away from isolationism or nationalism toward a more global approach. But right now, the sentiments of the electorate 
uh, would suggest that that's not going to be the case. Thank you. Um, kind of to your point of a global crisis, um, someone asked, don't you think that 9-11 attacks had an impact on the re-election of George W. Bush, which could also impact Trump? Well, there's, uh, I think it's a really smart question. And I would agree that while it certainly wasn't the only reason that George W. Bush was re was reelected, even though the 9-11 attacks had taken place more than three years before, the 2004 presidential election, it's pretty clear looking back that that rally round the flag effect that American presidents enjoy during times of crisis had not, they had not yet dissipated. And Bush's election over John Kerry was a fairly close one. And it's entirely reasonable to assume that the president was reelected, like I said, at least in part by the way voters felt that he had handled that particular crisis. That said, fast forward four years after that, President Bush was not running for re-election, but many of the same voters who thought that he had handled the aftermath of 9-11 very effectively were very, very disappointed in the way he and his administration handled the, the, the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina on the Gulf Coast. And even though Bush himself was not on the ballot, Republicans up and down the ballot, including John McCain running to succeed Bush, were I think at least in some part harmed by the voters' harsher judgment on how Bush handled Katrina. Right after uh, the pandemic broke, voters in this country rallied around the president. But we're already seeing even just a month into this, or a month or so into this, that those poll numbers are beginning to drop. And there's no way to predict right now whether Trump will gain or be harmed by his handling of the pandemic but I'd be careful not to draw too strong a parallel between Bush in 2004 and Trump in 2020, because voter support for Bush's handling of that crisis was much broader and much deeper than at least we're seeing currently for Trump's handling of this challenge. So I know you don't like making predictions, but someone asked, is Texas in play for Biden? Well, as, as some of you know, um, I, I gave up making political predictions forever in November of 2016 for understandable reasons. But the great thing about the question, it's not asking me to predict whether Biden's going to win or not. It's just asking whether it will be in play. And the answer, if I can sound just completely weaselly on this one, Jessica, is it might. And that isn't quite as cowardly a response as you might think it is. Because, of course, Texas has been one of the reddest of red states for many, many years. But as we saw a couple of years ago when Beto O'Rourke's campaign for U.S. Senate fell just short against Ted Cruz, we saw Texas Democrats winning large numbers of House and legislative seats in that midterm election. But what makes Texas at least a potentially competitive state for Biden is the state of the oil industry right now. Right now, oil prices, both here in the U.S. and globally, have dropped tremendously. And if you're a driver, that's good news. But if you work in the oil industry, either as an executive or a worker out in the fields, that's a horrible thing. And there have been widespread layoffs throughout Texas as oil prices have dropped around the world, at least partially as the result of this pandemic, in addition to the price war uh, between Saudi Arabia and Russia. But when we're all told to stay at home, we drive less. When we drive less, we use less gasoline. And when we use less gasoline, com companies and communities and whole regions of the country that depend on fossil fuels for their livelihood are being going to be hugely harmed economically. And if Texas is struggling economically as a result of the drop in oil prices in November, that could give Biden a chance to win a state that a Democratic presidential candidate has not won in many, many years. Uh, we did a members only talk yesterday on the oil sector specifically and and yeah your assessment is is very very right it is uh shocking how that industry is having to deal with this um someone asked campaigning in the time of the virus does the situation favor incumbents and she's referring to senate and house races uh, another excellent question uh are in, do incumbents benefit more than challengers on this landscape and the, the real answer is we don't know. 
um, because the last time we ran an election during a pandemic in 1918, um, there was no such thing as social media or the internet or cable TV or for all practical purposes, broadcast television. Um, so there is no precedent for this, at least in the modern era of politics. My best guess, not a prediction, Jessica, just a guess, is I think to a large degree, just as the president's reelection is gonna be judged on how voters handle him handling this crisis, I suspect the thing, same thing is gonna hold for incumbents at every level of office. In other words, if the economy is recovering by November and people are beginning to feel a little bit more secure, even if the world hasn't come back to normal, then an incumbent probably does have uh, some advantage if only because he or she is able to provide community and constituent services that are much more difficult for a challenger to provide. But come November, if we're still facing a really frightening, really desperate situation, then it's very easy to see how voters would turn on incumbents, blaming them not directly, but thinking of them as part of the lack of a solution. So just as Trump rises or falls on the strength of the economy, I suspect that many, uh, that many incumbents in both parties will as well. How do you reconcile the apparent lack of enthusiasm for Biden with the, the strong enthusiasm we saw in Democrats in Wisconsin recently? Well, the, the, the lack of enthusiasm for Biden that I was referring to, what I, I should have made more clear than I did, is relative. Um, Democrats are very excited. Uh, they're very motivated, if not by Joe Biden, they're very motivated by Donald Trump. And we saw that with voter turnout in Wisconsin, where even though the overwhelming majority of polling places were closed, people lined up for blocks and waited in line for hours in order to cast their votes. Now, to be fair, there was still a Democratic primary on the ballot, even if it was a fairly cursory one between Sanders and Biden. And you'll see a more balanced turnout there and elsewhere in, in November. But I guess the point that I should have made in, in that earlier point, in my earlier point, and I'm glad the questioner called me out on it, is the Democrats are motivated. They're just not quite motivated enough. More specifically, they're motivated, but they're not as motivated as Republicans. And in Wisconsin, a motivated Republican didn't really have much of a reason to turn out on election day. Trump wasn't facing a, a, real, uh, a primary opponent. And while the Supreme Court race that I talked about was an important one, it's certainly not the level of visibility of a presidential campaign. So Democrats are motivated, but their level of motivation still lags behind that of Trump's supporters. And what Biden is gonna have to figure out a way to do is to raise those motivation levels, particularly among young people, among voters in minority communities, and among Senator Sanders' stal most stalwart supporters, it's not to say that he can't do it, but if he doesn't do it, uh, then his campaign is gonna face a, a real difficult November. Thank you. Can college student protests and enthusiasm still influence the presidential election when colleges are closed? Well, well you're, you're talking to a, a college instructor here, and I would say that the, my students are, are frustrated with this current situation just like all of us are for all the same reasons we are but also but their but their but their difficulty in getting their heightened difficulty in getting involved politically has been a particular source of frustration um, a lot of them want to do internships a lot of them want to volunteer for campaigns or for causes that are important to them obviously under these circumstances it's impossible to have a political rally regardless of your age. Even the protests that we saw in Michigan and Virginia and other states over the last few days, these are generally drive-by protests where people drive around their state capital and honk their horns. And while that has some impact, it's not nearly, it's not nearly as much. My guess though is what'll happen over the next six months is that smart campaigns in both parties and innovative and creative and motivated young people in both parties, we'll find other ways to deploy those energies.
So they might not be standing at an event screaming and yelling on behalf of their favorite candidate. But if they spend that time making phone calls, sending emails, sending texts, engaging in online conversations with undecided or unmotivated voters, that outlet for their energies can probably end up being just as valuable, if not more. Might not be as much fun, but it could certainly end up making just as much of an impact. Yeah, I would think now that everyone is is at home and using their computer and actually getting a lot better at things like Zoom and webinars and everything like that, that the online campaigns actually might have bigger reach than they even had in 2016. Well, and you're exactly right, Jessica. And one of the things we know about digital campaigning, even before the pandemic, is how much more heavily campaigns and candidates rely on their supporters for successful outreach. And let me just take a minute and explain what I mean by that. An old school campaign, when it wants to reach voters, it runs a TV commercial or a radio ad or sends a direct mail piece. And it comes right from the campaign to you, the voter. That doesn't work nearly as well online. And what they end up needing to do in the private sector, the concept is known as viral marketing, is they rely on their supporters to do that outreach for them. So if you, Jessica, get an email from the Democratic National Committee the California Republican Party, odds are much more likely than not that you just simply delete it. But if you get that email from your friend Claire and she says, hey, Jessica, I know you usually just delete these things, but why don't you take a minute to read it? That's the way smart campaigns employ their volunteers to reach out to undecided or unmotivated voters, whether it's by email or text or by online conversations like this one. Thank you. Um, Trump's insistence he has total control and can overrule decisions made by the nation's governors flies in the face of the 10th Amendment. How can Americans support an individual ignorant of his constitutional role? Okay, I, I suspect a slight ideological and partisan leaning on the part of that questioner, but it's, 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 but it's the right question to ask. And it appears for me, to me, as much as I try to be even-handed and neutral in these, in these programs, that what the president on Monday said when he declared that he had absolute power and absolute control over these decisions, he was not only flying in the face of the US Constitution, he was not only flying in the face of the beliefs of governors, both Democrat and Republican, but Donald Trump on Monday was flying in the face of what Donald Trump said on Tuesday. So I suspect what happened is while the president, and sometimes it's a strength and sometimes it's a weakness, the president enjoys and often benefits from being the center of attention. And so it's not surprising that his natural instinct on Monday was to say, hey, I'm in charge here. And my, I, I suspect what happened is by Tuesday, he realized, as we talked about at the very beginning of this program, that the decision to reopen the country is one that's fraught with peril. Do it too quickly and you're going to suffer all sorts of not only health and medical consequences, but political consequences as well. And so my guess is that by Tuesday, Donald Trump had realized that while he will always proclaim yeah, his, uh, his certitude on these kind of matters, by later in the week, it looks like he's going to be content to advise the governors on what to do rather than telling them what to do um, and therefore end up sharing either the credit or the blame rather than taking the risk of having it all come down in his lap. Thank you. Uh, most people would think that another Republican candidate to challenge Trump is ill-advised. This possibility is slim to none, right? Will Trump choose a different running mate for vice president based upon Biden's selection? Well, the likelihood of another Republican uh, successfully challenging uh, President Trump has gone from very slim to very none. And as those of you with good memories may remember, uh, the president originally faced not one, not two, but three primar Republican primary challengers at the outset uh, of this year's campaign. Um, and one by one, all three of them has withdrawn. So he's clearly going to be the party nominee, barring extraordinarily unforeseen circumstances. The second question is a really, uh, is a really fascinating one. Would President Trump be tempted to dump Mike Pence from the ticket in order to replace him with a candidate who he thinks would be of greater use to him? And the answer is, of course he would. That doesn't mean he will, but I can't imagine he would hesitate for a minute 
if he thought there were another Republican who was better equipped to help him win re-election, he would not hesitate for a minute uh, to thank Mike Trump for his four years of service and send him along his way. Um, if he were to consider such a thing, I suspect it would be because Biden's selection of a female running mate, particularly one who elicited enthusiasm and support from female voters and well, and male voters as well, that Trump might be tempted to pick a female running mate of his own in the most logical or the most oft mentioned possibility in that regard is Nikki Haley, the former governor of South Carolina who served as his ambassador to the United Nations. Um, I think it's unlikely. There's always speculation about a president dropping a running mate and finding somebody new, but it hasn't happened for many, many years. And the reason for that is because presidents don't like to admit mistakes. And this one in particular would not want to say, hey, I, I did it wrong. But if it did look, and we know that married female voters are a key swing vote in this election, if it did look like Biden's running mate was beginning to cause a decent sized shift in that voting cohort toward Biden's, uh, toward Biden's candidacy, one thing that would liberate Trump is that it's worth remembering that in 2016, one of his main political motivations for choosing Pence was the fact that Trump at that time did not enjoy a great deal of enthusiastic support from religious conservative voters, from evangelicals and fundamentalists. And over the last three plus years, through judicial appointments and any number of other steps that Trump has taken, evangelical and fundamentalist and other religious conservatives are now the president's most enthusiastic supporters. So it's entirely possible to see how Trump or his advisors would say, we don't need Pence's help with that voting group. Maybe Nikki Haley or another woman could help us with voters who we need help with more. Got it. Will presidential debates be scheduled in advance before November? Why or why not? Can Biden stand up to Trump pressure on camera? Hmm. Um, presidential debates have already been scheduled and I don't have the dates and location at hand. I know we can send them out to you, but there is a presidential debate commission uh, that's completely bipartisan that the year before every presidential election picks three debate sites and three debate, three debate dates, as well as a site and date for one vice presidential debate. And ever since that system came into play in the 1980s, um, the two candidates have, uh, on almost every occasion, agreed to, degree, uh, to debate. Excuse me. There is some speculation uh, that Trump, despite his outward facing confidence, uh, might not want to debate Joe Biden and that there is a potential for him to find some reason not to participate in those debates, not to participate in debates at all. He might not like the television network that yeah, hosts them, the city that's chosen, the moderators that are picked. Um, right now, there's no solid indication that he won't, but it wouldn't be surprising to see Trump upend tradition as he has on so many other fronts by being reluctant to do so. That said, he says, uh, he can't wait to debate Joe Biden. Um, if that's the case, then they will take place. Although in an age of pandemic, obviously without an audience and almost certainly with the two candidates um, uh, debating by remote also. Given Trump's inconsistent actions and words on many issues, what do you think, or why do you think his baseline approval rating has not moved more dynamically up and down, as has been the case with previous presidents? Well, I mean, Donald Trump's approval ratings, except for a, a, a spike which now seems to have dissipated in the early days of this crisis, have been very consistent. And I think for reasons having less to do with him than having to do with our country as a whole. We as an electorate, we as a country, to become so polarized and so hyperpartisan that it takes a lot more to change a voter's mind about a president than it did 10 years ago or 20 years or 30 years ago. Um, there's been a considerable amount of academic research that's been done on this. And one of the things that we've learned is over the last generation, the reasons that voters pick a political party have changed in a very profound way. And we talked about this a little bit at one of the Cal Eisenberg breakfasts uh, earlier this year. Um, it used to be 
that most registered Democrats and most registered Republicans joined a political party because they agreed with, because they admired, because they supported that party and its candidates. Over the last generation or so, what's happened is a fairly profound shift. Now most partisans of both parties join their political party not out of allegiance to the party they've picked, but because of distaste and dislike for the other party. And if you're motivated by a repulsion toward the other side, rather than allegiance toward your own, then it's going to be much less likely that you shift or even change your opinion on favorability or unfavorability of a president because you're so uh, determined to keep a safe distance from the other side. And so Trump has his, you know, his base of 45 46%. Barack Obama's base was a little bit higher. George W. Bush's was a little bit higher than that. But that's more about trend lines in society than it is about the candidates or the presidents themselves. We're so suspicious of them over on the other side. It takes a lot more for a president to disappoint us than it used to. So we've kind of lowered our standards a little bit. That's that's maybe not so good. <laughs> no, we've um, lowered our standards, but maybe it takes a lot more to force us to reconsider the bad or for the good. No. Um, does Trump have the power to not only adjourn Congress, but to keep it adjourned indefinitely? Um, it appears that he does not. And for those of you who have not yet read the news of the president's uh, nightly briefing from Wednesday night, this was something that he asserted uh, in, his, in his briefing, that the Constitution gave him the power to adjourn Congress, therefore allowing him to make recess appointments um, to the courts and other positions. And the short answer, it gets into incredibly arcane constitutional law, and I'll do my best to avoid that, mainly because I'm not a constitutional lawyer. But the short version is, is that while a president can adjourn Congress, if the two chambers can't agree, the likelihood of that happening and the steps that would need to be taken for, according to the Constitution, Trump to be able to make that decision are just about infinitesimal. So it's theoretically possible, um, but it's almost impossible to conceive of a situation in which you would be able, uh, in which you'd be able to accomplish that goal. Um, do you think the pandemic will change the debate on healthcare financing? Well, the pandemic changed the debate on healthcare financing. Um, probably. Um, we're going to have a several month, if not a several year reminder. Um, about the benefits that come from government-sponsored health care. And whether that leads to a discussion of the type of single-payer system that Senator Sanders has been talking about, whether it's a more intermediate goal that Vice President Biden's been talking about, my guess is, is just the same way that 9-11 moved the discussion on national security and defense considerably toward the right. I think it's equally likely that this pandemic will move the discussion over health care to the left. The question is, is just how far. Thank you. And I think this will be our final question. Uh, do you think that our democracy is at risk right now? Is the U.S. in jeopardy of becoming a country led by a totalitarian leader, somewhat enabled by a figurehead legislative branch? Oh. Um, I, I don't think so. As many of you know, if you've come to our programs in the past, one of my favorite quotes uh, comes from the American humorist Mark Twain. And Twain famously said, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. And it's entirely true that our country has not been in this exact situation before. But we have faced profound challenges in the past. And while democracy is occasionally taken a hit along the way, particularly in times of crisis. Uh, Lincoln's suspension of habeas corpus, Roosevelt's decision uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, put American citizens in internment camps. During times of crisis, our civil liberties often um, are set to the side, if not entirely to a greater degree than seems the right thing to do once the crisis has passed. Um, 
this, this current situation isn't identical to those, but what we found is through the genius, the innovation, and maybe a little bit of luck on the part of our founders, we have a system that is resilient enough to withstand any, a particular crisis, a particular individual, if that's your concern, or a particular movement. Um, one of my new favorite books over the last few years is a, a wonderful book by John Meacham, the American historian. He wrote a book in 2017 called The Soul of America. And in that book, he points out that periods of division and hatred and this type of animus um, have existed in America since before there was an America. And he recounts in the book many of those previous examples and how we overcame them. I'll admit to you, Jessica, that when I first heard of the book, uh, The Soul of America, John Meacham, Amazon might not be able to get it to uh, you quite as quickly as under normal circumstances, but I promise you it's worth the wait. When I first heard about the book, I thought that's great. I need to be reassured that we can make it through these things. And I think what I anticipated, having read some very brief reviews of Soul of America, is it would be sort of a, well, good triumphs over evil, Luke beats Darth, the circle of life type of thing. That you know, good, good things happen for good people in good countries. And when I got the book, I found that it was something much more profound than that. Because what Meacham does masterfully, and for those of you who've read his other books, you'll know exactly, or any of his other books, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. What Meacham does instead is he doesn't just say, well, here was a bad period of time, and look, we got through it. What he goes to particular points, or particular lengths to point out, is that overcoming those challenges doesn't happen automatically. It's not a circle of life, Luke over Darth type of thing. And what he points out time after time after time, example after example after example in the book, is that the way we've overcome these challenges in the past is when good women and men unlikely women and unlikely men stand up for what's right and beat back these types of challenges. I'll offer you uh, an example from this book. And then if I can, since I know we have an extra minute or two, I'll recommend another book as well. <laughs> um, one example from the book really stuck, struck with me. A lot of these periods are pretty predictable. You know, Reconstruction, after the Civil War, um, you know, some of the backlash to the civil rights movement. You know, if you've studied American history at all, even in elementary school, you know about some of these circumstances. Meacham cites a statistic um, from the 19 teens, um, just about 100 years ago, as a matter of fact. And in the 19 teens, um, there were 75 members of the US House of Representatives, 75 members of the US House of Representatives who were publicly declared members of the Ku Klux Klan. 75. Oh. Such were the divisions in our society. For any of you who've ever seen the movie Birth of a Nation or read of it, you understand how rife sentiments were in this country at that time. And while he also talks about the incredible work that people like Lincoln and Roosevelt and Johnson and others did over our history, he talks at this instance about people like Calvin Coolidge and Warren Harding doing what was right in order to help beat back these sentiments. Now, this isn't me you know, arguing for Harding or Coolidge to go on Mount Rushmore, but it is to go back to the point we were discussing a minute ago, um, that in order to overcome these things, it can't just be the usual actors. It requires unexpected heroes being willing to stand up. And to me, um, while I wouldn't have wished this pandemic upon mine or our worst enemy. If this common challenge does remind us of the need to stand together, even while socially distant, against a common foe, maybe that can help inspire people who felt that they were too small for these kind of challenges to realize that if we take them on together, we can beat them back. And if we can beat back a disease that's a medical virus, we can also beat back a disease that's racism and division and hatred. Um, 
I tend to get a little bit expansive uh, a lot of these days, <laughs> and I apologize for that. But I think Not that last question was such an important one because I know a lot of us worry about the challenges that we face now. But I think the, the way to remember it is we haven't been here before, but we've been here before. And we do have a system in place, whether by brilliance or by luck or by both, that gives us an opportunity to sustain through the worst and come out well on the other side. Well, thank you, Professor Schnurr. There was one other book you wanted to give us homework for before next Thursday's class. What was your other book recommendation? We can talk more about this next week, but the other book that I would recommend, <laughs> and please remind me, Jessica or Kim, All right. and, I will, and we can talk about it a little bit next week, is another phenomenal book uh, by Michael Duffy and Nancy Gibbs, who were then the editors of Time Magazine, who wrote a terrific book about called The President's Club. The President's Club is not a book about presidents. It's a book about former presidents, people who after they left office being willing to work across party lines in order to help the country toward its common good. And many of you know stories about Bill Clinton and George H.W. Bush working together uh, to uh, confront the worst of the crisis in Haiti some years back. But the book, and if we do have time next week, it'd be worth a few minutes to discuss, stories of people like Dwight Eisenhower, of Herbert Hoover, of un once again, unlikely heroes stepping forward because as former presidents, they understood the importance of working together across party lines. So uh, there are things you can praise, there are things you can criticize about this president, but the one recommendation I would make to him if given the opportunity is that there is a wealth of experience on both sides of the aisle from those individuals who sat in the Oval Office before the current, current document, and that there has to be some way putting partisanship aside that Barack Obama and George Bush and Bill Clinton, and perhaps Jimmy Carter, can be of some help to bring a country together at a time when it so desperately needs it. Thank you. Dan, thank you so much for a very informative and insightful discussion as usual and for the great book tips we really appreciate that i'm sure we're going to be on amazon right after this program for all of your our viewers today thank you so much for joining us next week's live streams will include a partnered program with the la world trade center on transitions in trade in north america with the consul generals of canada and mexico mexico and of course we're going to have dan back next thursday for a continuation of today's series, Politics in the Time of Coronavirus, of the Coronavirus. Please visit our website for more details on how to become a member and also how you can support our programming through donations and to sign up for new programs next week at lawac.org. Stay safe, stay informed, and see you soon. Thank you. Thanks so much.